Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to assume you were in the first part of, of the talk, um, so I'm going to start anew, uh, but I'm not going to repeat everything I said. So, um, so I, I, was, I was telling people that um, there are different forms of indexes, uh, and we could talk about different things, like for example, Parquet is, I consider Parquet as an indexed format, so it's a form of indexes. But here we're interested in um, uh, implementing sets of integers, which is um, a particular form of index. And um, we were present, I was presenting uh, roaring bitmaps, which are um, a fairly popular um, approach to, um, to, to index sets of integers. And it's basically a collection. So a given, um, a given roaring bitmap is basically a collection of containers. Um, some of them might be arrays of 16-bit integers. Some of them might be bit set um, containers. And some of them might be um, collections of, of runs. So there's a continuous sets of continuous values. So we're working with, um, so, so we have to code this. We have to implement this efficiently. And um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So one, one important trick that we need to pull is that we need to, uh, at all time, we need to know how many uh, bits there are in, um, in a given container, how, how many values there are in a given container. Um, so we need to keep track of that so we can convert our containers automatically when needed. Um, now, there would be different ways to approach this, but we try to do it as automatic as possible because we don't want the, the user to, be, uh, um, to have to do a lot of uh, clever things to, to use our code. So um, here's a fun, um, a, a, a fun example. So um, in the previous talk, I, um, I explained that you could basically set a bit in a bit set using just about three uh, instructions on an X64 uh, processor. Uh, it was very, very fast. And, um, and now what about, uh, what about the following problem, right? So you have a, a bit set, and you want to set a bit, but you want to somehow increment the counter if the value of, of the, the bit you're, you're setting to 1 was previously 0. Right? So, so basically, if you're adding a new value because you're, you're, setting, you're moving a bit from 0 to 1, then you want to increment the counter. Um, I'm not going to go through these lines of code, but that's basically uh, one way to do it that's fairly fast. Uh, and basically, the only extra work you do is, uh, is the second last line, where we do an XOR uh, with a shift. And this is, this is the extra work. Um, so if you're stuck in like Scala, Java, or uh, C, or whatever, uh, that's probably uh, the, well, at least it's the best I could do, but there are maybe, uh, but it's still fairly good because there's no, the, the, there's no branching, right? So this is, so, so if you have, if you add one or two instructions, then, then that's, that's, that's all you have to pay for. Uh, but if you have a, a good compiler or your, your, um, you, you can code in assembly, uh, you can do it uh, uh, better. So um, you can do it, uh, for example, um, in the following manner. So I'm not going to assume that all of you are experts in assembly. So don't, don't actually look too hard if you don't know assembly. But basically, um, the only extra work that's needed to keep track of the cardinality is the line with, uh, that starts with SBB. Uh, that's the only thing that's really uh, extra uh, because 
uh, x64 processors that have these, these really nice fancy instructions, um, um, like uh, BTS, which is bit, test, and set. So it actually tests a value and, 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 and set the value of a flag if, if the value was, was set previously, and then it sets it. So it does exactly the work we need to do. Um, so it's really brilliant. So, so basically, you, 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 can, um, you can maintain, you can keep track of the cardinality uh, of a bit set uh, with almost no overhead whatsoever. Um, now, going back to a high-level ar architecture issue, uh, I told you that we, we want to deal with different container types. And that's because it gives us flexibility to accommodate different data distributions. And so if you want to go for uh, great performance, uh, having, uh, having this flexibility is great. But now you have to think that if you want to combine uh, two bit sets, a uh, two bitmap, um, you might have to uh, interoperate between different container types. So you might have this array container and it might, uh, you might have to, say, intersect it with another array container, another bit set container, or another run container, and so forth. So you get this, this big ma matrix, right, three by three matrix, and the output can be of different types also. So obviously that's uh, a little bit of a software engineering issue. So you could, you know, it would be very tempting to say, well, I'm going to um, create some high-level API, right? I'm going to abstract out the problem, and I'm going to make all con container types appear, you know, to the programmer as if they were all the same, right? Um, the problem w with an approach like that, I mean, abstraction is necessary in software engineering if we want to remain sane, but the problem is that uh, performance-wise, it's basically like sipping um, straw, right? So you can, you're speed limited. You can only ingest the data so fast if you, have, um, if you, have, if you go through um, very abstract APIs. So, so we have to bite the bullet, and we actually have to implement each and every case possible, uh, which is not so bad because if we limit the scope and we only want to implement, a, 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 say, a library, a roaring bitmap library, for example, then we're, we're probably not going to end up with two million lines of code at the end, but we, it's still a lot of work. So I'm going to give you some examples of what we had to do to get good performance. So, so let's say I've got two bit set containers and I want to intersect them. Right? Now, now, the intersection could have very few values. If it, if it has very few values, then uh, I don't want to store it as a bit set, right? Because that would be wasteful. I'd, be, I'd have lots of zeros. So I want to store it as an array instead. Um, but I don't know how big it will be before I've actually computed the intersection. So a good heuristic we found and I'm going to elaborate a bit more on this later, uh, is that we first compute the cardinality of the result without materializing anything. So we don't, it, it, there's no allocation that goes on. We just take the two bit sets, we intersect them, but we just compute the cardinality. We don't, we don't do anything else. We don't materialize the result. And then based on the result, we either decide, okay, we go back and this time we know the output is going to be an array or else, we generate the bit set in full. Right. Um, so we tested this, and, and this works very well. Um, when we want to compute, say, the union between two bit sets, then it's kind of easy, because we know there'll be a lot of values set, so it won't, there won't be any need to go back to an array, because there'll be a lot of values. Uh, the only trick is maybe we'll need to, uh, maybe it will be better to use runs to represent the result, right? 
And this can be a very potent optimization because uh, let's, uh, in practice, in real live scenarios, very often if you have lots of bit sets and you intersect them, at some point you get a long run of ones. And, um, and processing needlessly long runs of ones is wasteful. It's much better to know, that, uh, for, for the, the, the software to know that uh, all of the bits are set, for example. Then it can bypass, it can avoid very expensive uh, computations. Um, so I was telling you that if you have th these two bit sets, uh, you want to, you know, you want to very quickly uh, get the, the, the cardinality, the, the number of values in the, the intersection. And how you would do that is with, uh, in Java, uh, is with uh, the following loop, right? Where uh, long dot bit count is a function that actually counts the number of ones in, um, in a, in a 64-bit uh, word in, in Java. So what is this function? OK, so you can fairly easily, uh, because these days Java is open source, so you, you can go and, and see how it's, in, how it's I mean, uh, uh, what the source code looks like. And you get this, uh, this function that's credited uh, to um, a, a very good book, Hacker's Delight. And um, so it's a standard way to, to compute this, uh, to count the number of ones. And it looks a little bit painful. I mean, um, y y you know, uh, there's a lot of shifting and lot. I mean, these are cheap, cheap operations, but it, it seems like there's a lot of them. Okay, so how expensive is it? Well, just for fun, we're going to go to uh, C, right? We, uh, we, we, even if we don't care about C, uh, C is a good language to test things out. So, so in C, I'm going to present to you another way to do the same thing, to count the number of, of ones in a word. So that, that's a function that does that. Uh, it's, it's also a very, it's a very, it's, it's simple if you know what it's doing, but if you, if you don't know exactly what, if you, if you don't, um, if you've never seen it before, it's kind of hard to reason, but it's, it's actually loop around, um, if you, have tw if you have 12 ones in your word, then it's going to loop around 12 times, each time you're raising one of them, and then it's going to, co to, to terminate, uh, and, and you'll have to count. So it's, uh, it's going to work. Um, uh, so how fast is this function? So, okay, let's, before benchmarking it, let, let, let's try to compile it, right? Okay, so, it, it, it compiles to one instruction, right? And if you've got, uh, you know, if you've got a laptop, uh, an Apple laptop, you can actually test this out uh, if you don't believe me. And, and it actually works, um, it actually works even at the lowest optimization level. So it's one instruction on an X64 processor, uh, which is fairly good because this, this instruction is really, really fast. It's, uh, it's one, uh, uh, your, your processor can execute one per cycle, so um, it doesn't get a whole lot better than that. So, uh, and it's a, little bit, it's a little bit magical, right? Because uh, maybe you used to think, well, okay, I, I, you, you write in, say, Scala or Java or something, and then you think of C as some kind of, um, you know, high level assembly, right? Where, you know, people write in C, they, they, they work directly on the machine somehow. But as you can see, that's not true. The, the optimizing co compilers actually do lots of magic, uh, even in C. So, so what about going back to Java? Okay, so, so what is Java going to do with this? Actually, it's going to do exactly the same thing as the, the, the C-Lang compiler. It's going to, do, it's going to compile it to pop count on X64 processor as long as your hardware supports it, 
which you can check uh, with uh, you know this this, um, this uh, command Java uh, blah 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 with the correct flag, and it's going to tell you whether your hardware supports it. Well, actually, whether the, the the your Java virtual machine actually knows that your hardware supports it. But there's a there's a there's a trick to it is that you have to count you have to call it. Uh, specifically from long dot bit count. If you write your own function, um, uh, the, the Java compiler is not going to recognize it, and it's going to be slow. But if you call long dot bit count, then it's going to be fast, and, and that's because it's a, an intrinsic, and, and you have a bunch of them, and they're fairly important to know if you're um, if you're doing some high performance indexing. Um, and they're a bit tricky because um, not all of them actually get converted to a really fast instruction. You have to check on hardware you're working on uh, whether they do get uh, converted to a fast instruction. But when they do, it's, it's really brilliant. Life is beautiful. So uh, if you have to write hardware, which is basically almost all hardware these days, uh, that, then uh, how fast will this code run? Well. It's actually it's going to use about um, two cycles per uh, pair of 60-bit words, so it's fairly fast, right? So if you have a thousand uh, pairs of words, then it's going to about it's going to be about 2,000 cycles, um, which is fairly fast. And actually, I wish we we could go even faster, and, and we we can actually go a little bit faster than that, quite a bit, but. Uh, uh, it's going to be hard, say, from Java to do a lot better than two cycles. Uh, but I, I think the processor could do a bit better ago. So, uh, so, so you have this magic where uh, all operations between two bit sets uh, can be really, really fast, even if you need to know about the cardinality of the result. Uh, that actually does not carry a lot of over, over, overhead. And this is even true if you work in the Java virtual machine. Uh, and and so and so th this overhead um, can be fairly small, and actually it's going to be probably in a lot of cases negligible compared to other co costs such as uh, cache misses. Okay, so um, w what's great about say uh, Roaring is that it illustrates a lot of algorithms that. Uh, uh, that we all need to know, I think, if we do when we do high performance programming. So, one of them is uh, when we want to intersect two arrays, for example, then uh, there's kind of a textbook way of doing it, right, where we, you advance in, in your two arrays, and, and, and when you encounter two values that match, you, 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 you just say, ha ha, you, you say, you say I, I find something. Um, but you have, we, we have to recognize that in some cases you can do a lot better than, than naive code when you have two arrays of unequal size. So one of them is much smaller than the other one. In that case, then we, uh, we switch to galloping, a galloping intersection. And I'm not, not going to go through this code, but the intuition is the following. If you have very, very few values in one of the two arrays, and basically, the best thing you can do is do a binary search for each of these values in the large array, which tells you that you should be able to get an, an n log m um, complexity, right? which is going to be better than the naive intersection, which is typically going to be have a, a complexity which is given by the sum of the size of the two arrays. So we selectively fall back on, on something like that. Um, I'm not going, through, go, going to go through all of the scenarios we, we needed to implement, uh, but at least one more. So, so when we need to compute the union between two uh, arrays, it's possible that the result could be a bit set, right, if it's big enough. So what we do, a good heuristic that's actually uh, principled 
is, is, to, is to take the sum of the two arrays to look at whether the sum is, is sufficiently large, so it exceeds a given th threshold. If it does, then we take, we, 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 um, we take the two and we, we generate a bit set immediately, a bit set container as the result set. And then, uh, and, and then we, we record uh, the cardinality of the result. And if the cardinality is too small, then we compress it back to an array. But very often we, we're lucky, and, and the result is going to um, be uh, well suited for a bit set. Uh, so other things that are, are fun, so if you've got a, a bit set and, and an array and you want to compute the intersection, right, you would probably be tempted to code it like that. So you iterate through the values that are in your, in your, that are in your array, and then you check each one of them to see if they're uh, in the bit set, and if they are, you add it to the, you output it to your result. If you benchmark this, depending on how you benchmark it, you're going to get on, on a recent x64 processor, you're, you're going to get in between three to 16 cycles per, per value, per array value, assuming you don't, uh, assuming everything is in cage. Um, so that's not bad. But it's a little bit annoying that you go from three to 16 cycles. You know, you, you want the three cycles. You don't want the 16 cycles. Um, as it turns out, uh, you can, using a, a, an old trick, you, you, you can actually uh, remove the branch entirely. And then you do get a flat three cycles, no matter what. Uh, and basically, the trick is to replace the, the branch by, uh, by a, a store. So each, each, you always store the result in the output, no matter what, but you advance your pointer only uh, when, when, when the value matches. Um, so uh, if, you've, if you want to compute the, the union between an array and a, a bit set, well, it's something we already discussed. If you want if you don't want to track to, to cardinality, then uh, you get 1.65 cy cycles per value. But if you want to track to cardinality, then it's a little bit more expensive, but really not that much. Um, so unfortunately, we've been, well, roaring is implemented in a lot of different languages. Um, but we have a C implementation that's fully vectorized, and we think that's really important. Um, and one of the reasons it's important is because we, our processors now have advanced vector instructions. Uh, and that's true from the Raspberry Pi all the way to, to your PC. And these vector instructions are really simple and powerful, and the idea is that instead of doing uh, additions, Value by value, you, 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 do, uh, you can do additions over entire vectors of values, right? So that's, that's really powerful. And one of the reasons why it can be really powerful uh, for us, for example, is that I told you that we were using arrays of 16-bit integers. Now, normally using... Um, using small values, like 16 bits, does not help performance at all because in scalar code, it's, if anything, makes things slower. But if you work on vector instruction, it just means that in a given vector, in a given register, vector register, you can store twice as many f values, which means that you can go uh, at maybe uh, twice the speed. So that, 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 that's a really nice trick. Um, and uh, bit sets are really, really well suited for vectorization. Pretty much all the operations that you can think of uh, can be uh, vectorized. And um, we're getting, like this year is probably the year we're getting um, 512 bit uh, vector registers on upcoming, um, I mean, you have Canon Lake that's, that's coming soon, I hope crossing my fingers, um, and should support, uh, should, should provide us with 
widespread support for for this, which means that we have these we're going to have these huge registers. Um, and already Java supports AVX, which provides uh, you know 356 bits um, per register. So that, that's really pretty good. Um, and it's really important. Like vectorization is super important. So, so for example, if I if I want to compute, say, in place the 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 union between two bit sets, if I if I do it with scalar code, uh, you know, I, I get good results. And it's super fast. I mean, but but if I vectorize the process, I can go 3.5 times better, and. And if I go to AVX uh, 512, then I'm going to, um, I've got a, 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 a night's landing processor, so I, I can make some comparisons. Um, I'm going to go even, even faster. I'm going to go five times faster. And, and these gains are on top of anything I could get with multi-core processing and distributed processing. This is really. Um, this is really powerful. Uh, it's, it's so powerful, and we have an upcoming paper on this that we can, you know, I was telling you about this fast instruction pop count. We can actually uh, already on machines we have today, we can go twice as fast as pop count um, uh, with vectorization. And a lot of operations like um, the union between two arrays, the difference between two arrays, uh, the, uh, the intersection, and so on. Can be uh, can be vectorized, and, and um, you can compress sorted arrays. Like for example, uh, there was this talk about parquet, for example. And, and, but many of the operations uh, that parquet needs can be uh, can be vectorized. Uh, even crazy things like dictionary coding and so on can be vectorized very efficiently. Um, sadly, Java is a little bit limited, so. Uh, Java uses uh, under the hood uh, vector instructions, but uh, you know, uh, for fairly simple things. And it seems that the minute you try to go uh, off heap with unsafe, you basically disable um, vectorization. Um, but th 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 there's a little bit of hope. Um, uh, so it seems that Oracle recognizes the need for to to. Uh, to hook up uh, vector instructions in in Java, so maybe maybe it's going to come, but it's not going to be in Java nine, I think. Um, I'm going to conclude very quickly with um, just an example of work we did. So um, uh, things like Lucene and, and, and so forth, search engines in general, uh, they use compressed formats. Um, so one of them is, is vbyte, where basically you use one byte to store the integers that are small, and then two bytes to store the integers that are a little bit larger, and so on, and so forth. And this can be a bottleneck. So uh, Google developed uh, something called uh, variant GB uh, to go faster. Uh, but the problem is that if you're stuck, because you have to be compatible with Java, or, uh, and so forth, you, you stuck with the original format, uh, it, it can be kind of bad uh, if you have a bottleneck. Uh, but we, we've shown that um, with uh, its joint work with um, Indeed.com uh, that we can actually uh, multiply by almost a, a factor of two the decoding speed using vector instructions. Of course, this is, this is in C, not in, in, in Java. Uh, but but uh, sometimes you, you can um, <clears throat> you can mix a Java and C to for good results. So um, so this is uh, so this is uh, so you can go and try it out. We have uh, the code is on GitHub, and we have uh, wrappers in Python, Go, and Rust, and so forth. So you can call it from uh, your own uh, favorite language. Thanks, Daniel. Let's give him a good applause. Thanks. Now, do we have any questions? Do we, so we have two microphones here. Uh, 
Hi, thanks. That was, uh, that was great. I, I, I love the programmer porn. Um, so one of the questions I had is just for like context, right? Um, if we have RDDs or data frames in a Spark cluster and we have a, a bitmap index that's, that's, that's connected to one of those things because it's, you know, uh, some predicate where it's true or false or something like that, we want to be able to quickly uh, scan out for one of those, right? Um, since by nature RDDs and a distributed system like Spark cluster aren't sorted in any particular way, right? The partitions are kind of mixed up randomly and usually if they're not sorted within the partition, they're also as well, the, the, the records in the partitions are unsorted. How do you actually, uh, you know, have the bitmap index correlated to the, the, uh, the, the data with the records in it? Thanks. Um. Uh, well, that, that's a theoretical question we would have to, uh, to go implement it, but I, I don't think you need, um, yeah, it's a little bit technical, so, so maybe we could talk later, but um, b basically when, when you construct uh, the index, you don't have to store, to, you don't have to store the identifiers in order. You can, you can store them out of order. Um, so that's, I, I don't know if it answers the questions, but. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big topic, surely. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so I have actually one question. Uh, you obviously have done some uh, very impressive work on, on, on optimizing the performance of your algorithms, and I am definitely not at this level of programming. Actually, I would say I'm a very basic Java or a C++ programmer. And do you have a sense of um, how much of an improvement you have done from an algorithm that you may give to someone who have had uh, basic classes into programming, who knows how to program fairly, in a fairly efficient manner loops and, um, and arrays, down to now the vectorized um, implementation that you have shown. Uh, do you have a sense of how, mu how much gain in performance has been done in, the, in between the two of it? Is it one yeah. order of magnitude or even more? Yeah, 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 that, that, that's a good question. So, so we, we're definitely talking about, you know, one or two orders of, of magnitude very often. Um, uh, with, with the caveat that uh, s sometimes in, in actual systems, right, the problem are more I'm, I have more to do with architecture, right? Because this is this is uh, this is low level. This is micro architecture, right? And so micro architecture is very important. But of course, you have to get the high level issues right before you you worry about about these micro architecture issues. So so if you're a lambda programmer and uh, you're not very good and you're programming yourself, probably your your big mistakes are going to be higher level than that. Um, so really, this work is for people who are very good. They get, they, they have the right architecture, and then you just need, you know, to write boost at the low level stuff. Right. Great. So let's applaud again, Daniel. Thanks again. Thanks.